Some people call our next storyteller a shark catcher, a winemaker, an adventure traveler. Here at the snap, we call him the closer. Please put your hands together for Mr. James Judd. Well, nobody said, don't come on stage with a martini and a tambourine. <laughs> the late 1990s, like the year 2000. Well, I'd been practicing law in New Hampshire and blah, 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 blah. There was sort of like a family drama. Nobody cares about that. I needed to come back to California and take care of it. And uh, while I was here, I thought, you know, it's going to take longer than I expect. I need to get some sort of job. So I find this amazing job in the East Bay for this legal self-help book publisher. And uh, it's my job to take their stuffy old books and make them hip, make them snappy, make them fresh, make them ready for the youth crowd. So like I take a book like How to Do Your Own Divorce and I put it back out in the world as Your Half is My Half. I love it. But then I meet this Puerto Rican guy named Eric and he moves in and then like his whole family moves in and pretty soon I'm supporting this whole Puerto Rican family. And I, and I bought a little house, you know, in Oakland. I didn't even realize how much it was gonna cost to have a house in Oakland. Um, and you know, it was on a hill. It was in a neighborhood that some people derogatorily refer to as San Leandro. <laughs> it wasn't, it had an Oakland address. It was right by the zoo. On a hot day, you could smell the giraffes. Sort of like a bean burrito that's exploded in the microwave. <laughs> anyway, I thought, you know what? I cannot get on with this. I, I, I'm not making enough money. What am I going to do? Well, this was the height of the first great dot-com boom, and San Francisco was its epicenter. So I thought, I've got to get in on this. People were becoming millionaire, millionaires overnight. Money was just falling from the sky. People were going to, going to work in their pajamas. They were bringing their dogs. They were playing ping pong. It was an amazing time like we'll never experience again, except for like right now. <clears throat> of course, then it got disrupted. But before we get to that, <clears throat> so I thought I got to get in on this. But what, what can I do? Well, I look in the want ads and I find an, uh, uh, an ad for this big fancy technology magazine that's looking for someone with legal and technology knowledge. I think, well, this is perfect. I have some legal knowledge and I use technology. So how hard can it be to write about it? <laughs> I send in my resume and immediately the editor-in-chief calls me in and he looks at my resume and he says, well, this is a very impressive resume, but I don't actually see here that you have any experience in the technology sector. We're the biggest technology magazine out there. We cover all the major players and issues. Do you know anything about technology? And I say, no. He said, well, can you start Tuesday? And just that, like that, I'm hired. And they start sending me out immediately in all these exotic places like Cupertino and Los Gatos, the cat, and the Milpitas and Fremont. It's very exotic. And I'm loving it. And one, one day, my boss says, pack your bags, you're going to China. <gasps> Oh my God, I think I have always wanted to see the Great Wall. It's my dream. Well, I'm only gonna be there for 48 hours, but I don't care, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna get to the Great Wall, it's gonna be terrific. Well, there's one little twist to the story. Um, a couple days earlier, this spy plane was forced to land off, a coast, uh, off the coast of China. Anyone remember that? So the Chinese government has said there's going to be no more uh, visas for U.S. journalists. It's not going to happen, no way, no how. So my boss wants me to sneak into China as a tourist, interview these five guys he's got picked out, and get home without getting caught. Well, it seems like kind of a bad time to be trying to pull a fast one on the Chinese government. <laughs> But you know what? I weigh my options. I think, well, I could refuse to go on moral grounds, but possibly lose my job and lose my house and lose my boyfriend. Or I could go to China and risk getting caught and I wind up in a Chinese prison and I wake up one day missing my kidneys. <laughs> I'm going to 
going to China. And I'm gonna go because I'm gonna be there on my 36th birthday and I think it will be great, great luck to celebrate my 36th birthday by standing on the Great Wall of China. At least this is what I tell the people at the uh, embassy near the Kabuki Hot Springs, which by the way is fabulous. You should definitely go there if you can. And uh, well, they, you know, they kind of have a little qualm, but then they stamp my passport and I'm off. But, um, okay, well, I don't, I almost don't get on the plane. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I am something of a nervous flyer. And whenever I have to fly, I always try to get to the boarding gate a little bit early so that I can get a good look at the plane <laughs> just in case I can see anything wrong with it. <laughs> that maybe everyone else on the ground has missed. <laughs> well, this time, the 747 that I'm about to board has this nose press right up against the glass. And first of all, it's filthy. But I'm like, okay, I can get past it. There's probably a lot of bugs over the Pacific Ocean. But there on the side of the nose comb, plainly vis visible, are several large pieces of electrical masking tape in kind of a patchwork formation, like they're covering some sort of hole in the plane. That's not the big problem. The big problem is that some of the pieces of tape appear to be peeling off. So I turned to my mother who took me to the airport that morning. I said, I'm not getting on that plane. My mother looks at the plane, me the plane, me the plane, me the plane, me. She says, how come? I said, because that plane is being held together with duct tape that's gonna fall apart over the Pacific Ocean and take me with it. My mother says, oh, would you please stop being such an evil queen? <laughs> I say, it's not evil queen, it's drama queen. <laughs> I don't care if you watch Will and Grace reruns every night, but let's get the terminology right. She says, I don't care if you're a Dairy Queen. You're going to be 36 years old in two days and you have got to have a job. Oh, you are so dramatic. I should never let you watch those soap operas when you were a kid. Here, I've got a volume in my purse. You can take it if I can find it. Well, here it is. Well, well, I don't have my glasses on. I'm not exactly sure what this is. It's either a Valium or a Premarin, but you're gonna take it and you're gonna get on that plane. Where's my chair? Well, I take it and I get on the plane and it must be something strong because no sooner have we gone down the runway than I fade to black. And when I wake, I'm in China. <laughs> well, I rush to the hotel, I go to the business center, I email my parents to let them know I've arrived safely. And my father happens to be online at the time, so he instant messages me back. He says, oh, I'm so glad to hear you've arrived safely. Your mother said it was the worst looking plane she'd ever seen. <laughs> Christmas list, mom. Well, I have no time, I have no time to worry about it. I put on my blue pinstripe suit, I put on my red tie, my shiny black shoes, I rush out of the hotel to find a limousine waiting for me. And next to the limousine is a very tall guy in a black hat, mirrored sunglasses, black tie, black suit. He says, call me Mr. Goo. And I get into the back of the limousine and the five guys I've come to interview are already seated around this limousine. We're gonna drive around Beijing because they don't want to be seen with a US journalist. Now, these five guys were all born in China, but they, made, they were educated in the United States and they made millions of dollars on Wall Street, maybe billions of dollars. And now they've all moved back to China where together they have a plan to make China the leader in the world's technology race. Well, that's all good and fine if you know or care anything about technology, which I don't. <laughs> I just want to see the Great Wall of China and get home with my kidneys. <laughs> so we get into the back of Mr. Gu's limousine and we're driving around and they're talking about 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But here's what I do. When I, when I don't know what people are saying, which is most of the time, I don't know what these people are talking about. I mean, I can't even spell the words that are coming out of their mouths. But I've come, along, I've, I've come up with a little system to fake it, and I'm going to teach it to you now. This is going to be your takeaway moment from Snap Judgment, all right? I bring out a little tape recorder, and I say, I'm not going to take notes. Instead, I'm here to listen to you. And then they start talking about... I don't know. <laughs> and I do this. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. Good point. If you tell someone they have a good point, they will never challenge you. They'll go, go uh, can you just like uh, synergize what I just said and repeat it back to me and tell me how I had a good point? They'll just go, oh, I'm brilliant. They'll keep talking. So we're all gonna practice this together. It's gonna be your takeaway moment. Here we go. All together. Oh, mm, interesting. Good point. Here we go. Oh. Interesting. Good point. What's more with feeling? Oh. Mm, interesting. Good point. Touch your face when you say good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Any part of your face. Good point. I like your point. You've got a good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. So we're driving around Beijing and all of a sudden somebody pulls out a bottle of mysterious Chinese liquor, and everyone goes, hooray! And then shot glasses come out, and they pass it around the limousine, and everyone goes, hooray! And I take a sip of it. It tastes like a combination of black licorice and gasoline. I dub it, liquoline. And it goes around and around and around, and everyone goes, hooray! And pretty soon, everyone is really drunk. And then one of the guys turns to one of the other guys and goes, hey, why don't we take James with us and show him how deals are really close in China? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly what they're talking about, but I figure maybe this is how I'll get my story. So I say, sure, why not? And Mr. Goose speeds up. And when we stop and we step out, we're in the shadow of a giant neon hula girl. And her eyes are blinking and her hips are shaking. And she's playing the ukulele beneath two giant, pink, blinking, naked breasts. And I think, okay, well, a night of giant, naked breasts would be my second choice. <laughs> well, somebody rings the doorbell, and a woman with a beehive and a riding crop answers the door, and she goes, hooray! And all the guys go, hooray! And it turns out that all five of my wedding ring wearing companions are regulars here at the Garden of Eden. Well, Madame Roddingcroft leads us through a maze of corridors, of doors with little windows. And finally she opens the door and we step inside one of them and it's kind of a small room with green shag carpeting and wood paneling, a couch, a coffee table and a TV set. And we stand there awkwardly in silence for a few moments. And then Mr. Goo opens the door and in marches a line of girls. And they're all kind of tall and they have big hair and like sparkly tube tops and those very shiny, too much information Celine Dion pants. Except for one small girl at the end in a black cocktail dress and a side pony, really very chic. And one of the guys turns to me and he says, pick one. I say, oh. I'm here to listen to you. <laughs> he says, custom dictates that you've got to choose before we can choose, so you've got to pick one. All the guys start going, pick one, pick one, pick one, pick one, pick one. I think I her. And I point to the girl at the end in a little black cocktail dress, because I think that'll look the nicest next to my blue pinstripe suit. <laughs> and she comes over and she says, my name is Lisa, but I know it's the only thing she can say in English. And all the guys go, hooray! And they pick the girls and everyone goes, hooray! And then we all sit on the couch, and Madame Roddy Crop brings out another bottle of Lickaline, and everyone goes, hooray! And pretty soon everyone is taking shots of Lickaline and singing Desperado. <laughs> that TV comes to life, to life as a karaoke machine, the guys start getting up and singing. Well, first of all, conversation between me and Lisa is strained at best. <laughs> And my little laminated Chinese handy expressions card in my wallet doesn't include anything I care about, like 
Is it hard to find good skincare products in China? Or do you have a brother nearby? Or what's your favorite line from Valley of the Dolls? When people come to see a Helen Lawson show, they come to see one thing, Helen Lawson, and that's me, baby, remember? Awkward. Well, Madam Ronnie Crop takes a couple at the end of the couch, and she leaves them out. They're gone for about a half an hour. And they come back, no one says a word about it. And then she takes the next couple, and they leave. And the next one, and the next one, until pretty soon, Lisa and I are the last ones left in line. Well, that guy's hit that karaoke machine. And let me tell you something. These guys can rock! They've got pipes! They're hitting the Bon Jovi, the Sammy Hagar, the Leonard Skinner, the Karen Carpenter. And suddenly, somebody hands me a tambourine. Madam Ronnie Crop coming toward me. And she's got that look in her eye. Like, okay, gringo. It's your turn to see the big round bed in the back. I panic. I get up. I grab the microphone from whoever has it. I say, ha, it's, it's, it's my turn to sing. And I press through the, the list of songs. I press play. If I could turn back time. <laughs> Chastity. Now Lisa has an expression on her face that needs no translation. Because that expression means the same thing in every language of every country on the planet. There is something just not right about this guy. Am I gonna get a tip? Well, Madam Rod Riding Crop keeps coming toward me, and now I'm really panicked. But suddenly, just as she approaches me, one of the guys gets up and he whispers something in her ear, and she claps her hands, and all the girls, including Lisa, get up and they run out of the room. And one of the guys turns to me and he says, we've got a surprise for you. <laughs> okay, so here's the funny thing about me. Um, I am normally not the type of person who was ever at a loss for words. <laughs> I know that may seem hard to Im imagine for you now, uh, but uh, it, it, you know, I get it. I talk a lot, I talk really fast, you know, I, 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 I'm aware. I mean, one time a, a journalist in LA said, James Judd would be perfectly cast as that one hostage who just won't shut the fuck up. I'll take that part. I will play that, but no, I get it. But usually when I'm at a loss for words, it's when I'm in the presence of a famous person, like the night that Rosie O'Donnell hit on me. I'm sorry that story is too long, I cannot tell it to you now. Or my very, very ugly encounter with Geraldo Rivera. I'm sorry that story is too long, I cannot tell it to you now. Or sometimes it happens just in everyday life, like um, this morning I went to Union Square, I handed my driver's license to the clerk at Neiman Marcus, he went, wow, you've gained a lot of weight. <laughs> right? But usually it happens whenever I'm in the presence of my four Mormon aunts from Utah. Now, all the people on my father's side of the family are Mormon, and they all live in Utah, and they are deeply devout Mormons and deeply devout Republicans. I am so we've always had a very cordial, never seen, speaking, or referring to each other sort of relations. But once a year, all the ants will fly in from Utah to go shopping, usually at Christmas. And somehow, I get roped into taking them around. I, I take them around Union Square, and then I, I, I take them to the Cheesecake Factory. Mormons love the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> So 
So I will be sitting in some, you know, big booth, and uh, I'll got, I got some soupy cocktail, and the, the Mormon ants, Pat, Jane, or Jean, Dorothy, they're leafing through their laminated 20-page cheesecake factory menu. <laughs> Chapter two, salads. <laughs> And I look up at Aunt Mimi, the most religious and politically fanatic of the group. Ten kids, still loves George Bush, very suspicious of anything made with soy. <laughs> it's given me this look. What? I just feel really bad for you. Why? <gasps> because of your lifestyle? Because of your lifestyle, you will never get to experience God's greatest miracle to heterosexuals. I said, what are you talking about? I'm in the Cheesecake Factory, aren't I? I've seen the best of your world. And frankly, the fried avocado rolls are a little greasy. <laughs> when are you gonna have a baby? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say anymore. I don't know what to say. I mean, how many times can you answer the same question over and over and over again? I, I wish... I wish I had some sort of saucy, snappy comeback. Something, something Noel Coward or Oscar Wilde or even Charles Nelson Reilly. <laughs> something like, I guess, when my boyfriend grows a giant vagina. <laughs> it's becoming a hostile workplace. <laughs> I'm gonna talk to your manager. <laughs> and Mimi says, don't you and your Spanish friend want to raise a child? Now, my Spanish friend is Eric, my then California State Registered Domestic Partner of many, many years, and now my legally wedded spouse. And of course they know it. Oh, thank you, oh my gosh. Hey, listen, if you want to get us a gift, we're still registered on Craigslist. <laughs> And Eric is a native of Puerto Rico and a native Spanish speaker, and they all know it because we've been together now like 10 years or, well, 10 or 12 years, depending on how you do the math, because I stalked him for two years, so. <laughs> He's been with me for 10, I've been with him for 12. <laughs> and, and the fact is, no, no, I don't want a baby. Look, if I wanted a baby, I'd get a baby. Being gay has never been any barrier to getting a child. Are you kidding me? If I had a dollar for every single woman over 35 that tried to get sperm out of me to make a baby, I'd have three dollars. I can't go. I can't go. Eric and I would consider adopting an older child, but only if he or she completed some sort of course in bookkeeping. <laughs> we have troubles with our taxes, but I digress. Back at the whorehouse. <laughs> Madam Ronnie Crop is coming toward me. And she got that look that says, you're ready to see the big round bed in the back. And I'm starting to panic. I think I'm gonna do I gotta get out of this. And then one of the guys gets up and he whispers something in her ears and she claps her hands and all the girls, including Lisa, get up and they run out of the room. And I think, and the guy turns to me and he says, we've got a surprise for you. I think I'm trapped, I'm trapped. What am I gonna do? Even if I get out of here, I don't know where I'm basing. It's panic, it's panic. 
And just before I get up and I make a break for it, the door flies open, but instead of the Red Army, in marches Mr. Goo. And behind him come each of the girls, and their wavy lighted sparklers in their hands. And behind him comes Madame Ronnie Crop, and she's got a birthday cake that says, Happy Birthday James in Chinese and English. And the five Chinese billionaires, the six Chinese hookers, the one madam with the rotting crop, and Mr. Goo sing happy birthday to me at 3 a.m. inside of a Beijing whorehouse.